Adrian Webster, and uh, I have the privilege of pastoring this church. I um, want to welcome you here tonight. It's good to see so many people uh, joining us uh, to spend this time with us, to spend this time with Cherie. And we're really anticipating a week long of healing experiences. So um, just so that you're aware, I'll give you a little roadmap of where we're going for the week, and then I'll introduce Cherie, and we'll get right into it. So we're, we're going to try and maximize our time with each presentation with this little fanfare beforehand. Um, we're going to try and start on time each time as well. So um, uh, once again, thank you for coming. Thank you for being here on this cold night. Uh, you can feel that the, uh, the church is nice and warm, so you don't need to fear every night, even if it gets colder. Uh, throughout the week, just keep coming. This will be the one warm place in Whangarei, all right? So just make sure you're here every week. Okay, so um, what we've got is, uh, how many of you, by the way, heard the, the radio advert? I just want to get a feel for, for what worked. How many of you heard the radio adverts? No one? One. Okay, good. How many of you received a flyer in the mailbox? Okay. How many of you saw the newspaper advert? Oh, okay, great. How many of you were invited by a friend? How many of you had more than one of those happen? Okay, good, great, fantastic. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we're going to be, uh, to tonight's, tonight's program, if you receive one of these flyers, the entire program is on there. So tonight's entitled Miracle from the Streets. You're going to get to know Cherie very well. She's going to share her story and her journey and how she, uh, how she, by the grace of God, has come to where she is today. Because when you hear her story, if you haven't yet, you will soon figure out that only by God's grace could she get back from where she once was. And, and the goal of, of us spending this time together is so that you can see it doesn't matter how far you've gone or how far you might have fallen or what you've struggled with. If someone, no offense, Cherie, like Cherie, <laughs> can come back from where she was to be what God has made her today, then, uh, then you can too. Then you can too. Uh, so that's tonight. That's her story. Tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock, which is the normal worship hour service here for our church. So we're inviting you to come along to that. At the, during the worship hour service, uh, Cherie's going to present to us a really, really powerful topic entitled The Power of Forgiveness. Guess what it's about? Oh, yeah. Okay. Very good. Very good. Forgiveness, the key, the key to moving forward. It is the key to moving forward. Same, after, same day, tomorrow at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, Cherie will present to us again a topic entitled Unlocking Your Heart, How to Find Forgiveness. Now, in between the 11 o'clock uh, uh, message and the 4 o'clock message, there will be a lunch provided. So uh, if you want to come along, um, don't worry about the time. Don't worry about having to rush home to take care of lunch or anything like that. Just come. We will provide lunch, and you'll be able to hang out here, uh, pray, talk, get to know one another, and, of course, um, hear Cherie present. Then, Sunday is entirely free. There's no meetings on Sunday during the day, no meetings on Sunday in the evening. But then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at 7 o'clock each evening, same time as tonight, we will be hearing from Cherie again. So um, on Monday evening, it will be entitled The Addictive Personality. That will help you to understand what addiction is. We'll work, uh, work on um, understanding addiction so that we can begin to look at our lives and figure out, are there some kinds of addictions that don't fall into the typical categories that we may be oblivious to, but that in fact are holding us back? And then after that, we'll be talking about, uh, we're the topic is entitled Meet the God Who Delights in Your Recovery. Uh, the, the second to last evening will be Unlikely Ambassador, The Stages of Recovery, and then finally Laughing Out Loud in Your Own Skin. We'll be talking about the Holy Spirit in recovery as well. Okay, so we've invited you and we've decided to host this event because everywhere we look around us, people are broken. And if you're not one of those people that consider yourself very broken, you probably know someone who is very broken. And the truth is that even when we don't perceive that we ourselves are broken, that's usually because we're looking at someone that's a whole lot worse off than us. But when we compare ourselves to the original pattern, we'll find that there's significant dysfunction in every single one of our lives. Now, Cherie's going to be the first one to tell you, and I want to echo this, uh, we want to be the first ones to acknowledge that we too are on a journey of recovery. It's a lifelong journey. And so as we share with you over this week, we want you to know that we don't stand from the top looking down, but we stand right alongside you, recognizing that we too are in need of the grace of God. And that message is going to come through very clearly. 
Uh, at the end of each presentation, there will be an opportunity. If you feel like in some way you've, uh, you've heard something that's so relevant to you, you just want to connect with someone, talk with someone, or pray with someone, there's going to be a ministry team that's available for you to do that. Tonight and each night after the meeting, there'll be refreshments in the hall, which is just down the very icy corridor into a very nice warm room. So there's two warm rooms in this church, and in between is the danger period, right? So don't hang around in the foyer because you might get frozen, but if you move, if you stay in one of these two rooms, you'll be fine, all right? So uh, after each meeting, those who want to stay back, connect with someone, pray with someone, we'll do that in here. Those of you that just want to have some refreshments, connect with people, uh, uh, have some good conversation, just move down to the hall at the, at the other side of the church. Cherie, why don't you come forward? Right, have you turned, have you turned Cherie on? Cherie's got to turn, turn on the... <laughs> Let me just see if I could um, work this. Here we go. Great. How's that? Working? How are you, sir? I'm totally rock solid, totally sky high, totally unsorted of love. Awesome. <laughs> but you know what? They paid me to be here, so I'm going to take over. <laughs> All right? So, no, no. Well, hold, hold, hold. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, Cherie has come to us all the way, way from the United States. She spent about, uh, what did you say, 24 hours on hopping the plane. planes? And so, if I look jet lagged, just know I am. And if I am fragmented, know that I'm always that way. All right. And if you fall asleep mid sentence, just we'll kick just, me. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. So, Cherie, tell us a little bit um, where are you from? Like, what's actually home for you? Tell us about family. Yeah. Any of that kind of stuff. I'm from um, originally from Los Angeles, California, and um, I'm married to a, a classical musician, incredible guy. And what's really funny, you'll hear my background and his background, we're so different, but he's adorable. He, um, as at work right now, as he would um, have come with me, he has concerts all week. And I have a daughter that just graduated with addictions, a degree in addictions, and she um, just graduated college. and. Yeah, yeah. I have a television show called Celebrating Life in Recovery. It is my passion to work with people in recovery. And I used to think recovery was only addicts. And then I ran into a religious addict, and I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, you know, in my head, I couldn't put the two together. I'm like, you've never done a drug, but you are a mess, you know? And so I realized that addiction is addiction is addiction. And sometimes it looks way different but what it does to ourselves and our kids are exactly the same. And so, so um, I am passionate about coming out of addiction, even if you think your addiction is okay. Workaholism, um, drugs, religion, sex. Raise your hand if you're a sex addict. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so <laughs> I forgot New Zealand. They told me you guys don't even talk about sex, so I'm sorry about that. So let's <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. So, so what I'm hearing you say is um, there's, uh, there's probably going to be something in this journey over this week together that's going to connect with everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is it okay to laugh? Like It depends. When I'm talking? <laughs> no. Yes. <laughs> okay. well, what about crying? You know, I even think sometimes we have to laugh at ourselves. You know, I look back on my background. If I didn't laugh at some of that stuff, even my family, my, my, my dad died in a crack house. You know what I mean? And we're going to talk about that stuff. But sometimes I'll say, I'll say it in a way that is funny, but I think you have to. It's like we can't take ourselves so serious, so we'll just go hang ourselves. I mean, raise your hand if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like there, there are times that you just have to say, um, uh, man, it is, we have to laugh in this journey of recovery. Um, just not at each other. <laughs> <laughs> True. Right. What about crying? Is it okay to cry here? Yeah. I mean... Yeah. And what's even really interesting is, I, I, and I've talked to some people, they will tell you the most tragic things, and they've never cried. And you think, really? You can tell me that story, and you don't shed a tear? And I think that in our recovery, when all of a sudden you think, you know what, do you mind if I just cry for about 15 minutes? And I think it is so healthy to finally cry for yourself. Um, and, then, and then literally step away from that grief and get on with your life. So don't get stuck there. But raise your hand if you've never cried for some of the most tragic things in your life. 
Man, there are people that have never shed a tear. And so being able to say is that, that, that I was meant to laugh and cry and everything in between. Um, but man, when I was using, the only thing I knew is that if I felt anything, I just slammed some heroin or I just slammed some drugs. Um, so in my recovery, I've given myself permission to feel. Yeah. yeah. So last question for tonight, uh, Cherie, is um, you have this horrendous past. You come out of it. Why don't you just like walk away and forget about this whole thing? Why do you, why do you keep going back to talk about it to you get what I'm saying like yeah. why not just move on with your life yeah. and so w when when I felt like um, I was called to just say um, where I've come from uh, when I stood up the first time even my friend said that you know you know you are working in hospitals you are a nurse and doing recovery work your husband plays in the orchestra and is is you know um, you know all that kind of stuff why do you want to tell anyone this stuff and I think that I want to tell someone because somebody needs to know it's possible to recover. You know, there are a lot of people in this room that I'm not, I'm, I'm talking to because we're here and we're going to have a great time, but there's somebody in this room that's going to be life-changing. And so to me, I can't not say it. Um, you know, I know your background, and there are times that you share that um, deeply with someone because you know that it matters to them that they hear your story. Um, awesome. Awesome. One more thing. All right. You probably all got one or two of these things in your pockets. Oh, I thought we were going to do a selfie. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, one more thing, excuse us, I've got to post on Facebook. No, I'm sorry. Isn't that a form of addiction? <laughs> you know what, but I am. I'm an addict in the core of who I am. All right. All right. I'm so, sorry, go, go. So however Carry many on. of these devices you've got, if you wouldn't mind uh, either turning them off or switching them to silent, if for some reason it has to remain on. L let me just say it in a different way. I am ADD. If your phone goes off, I'll be sidetracked for about 15 minutes. <laughs> so please, right. silence your phone. Great. Cherie, right. let me pray with you, and then we'll hand it over to you. All right. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to be here together on this evening. We look forward to great things that you're going to be doing in our lives, and I pray that as Cherie speaks, we will in fact hear the voice of heaven tonight. And so for every person that's come here, uh, perhaps for the first time walking through those doors uh, into a strange place, meeting with strange people, not quite sure what's going on, I just pray that your, your sense of your presence and peace will be here and that, um, that we will be blessed together as we uh, embark upon this journey. So thank you for calling us to this place tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, when, it, when talking about just even answering those questions, I try to figure out how am I going to start this? Because tonight is about introducing me to you. Hopefully, before some of you leave, I get to hear a little bit of your story. Some people I recognize because we kind of hung out the last time I was here. So, so I know a little bit about your stories. But it's just like tonight is just that night. So I'm going to tell you as quick as I can or as much as I can tonight about my own journey. And I, when I first got into recovery, and please, if you relate to this at all, just wave. But I first got into this recovery, I changed clothes and tried to look as normal as possible. Has anybody done that? It's like you walk in, you're a mess, and you're like... Um, so, so I tried to do that, and I, and I had to do a lot of things and did some recovery work, and I delighted in every step of recovery. Like when I woke up and I didn't have to go use, or I woke up and, yeah, you know, uh, I, the police aren't looking for me. You know what I mean? All of that stuff was just such a cool thing. And um, so years into recovery, like 10, 15 years, um, I'm working in this hospital, and it was so, I, I was beside myself thrilled. And um, someone said to me, do you do anything for fun? You know, a friend of mine, do you do anything for fun? And I thought, man, I'm breathing. <laughs> to me, that's fun. And I think that people didn't know that, you know, I didn't think I would get a week recovery time, and then a month, and then a year, and now I'm 10, 15 years down the line. Does anybody know what I'm saying? That's an incredible place to be. And she says, do you do anything for fun? I said, you know, you know, you, you know, yeah. And she said, no, no, just fun. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, I got a job fundraising at the Philharmonic. Why don't we go to a concert? And I just imagined myself as a recovering heroin addict sitting in a concert. I thought, is that legal? Do you know what I mean? I think it, and I couldn't, I, it was just too normal. And I thought, I just can't do it, you know. And I made some jokes and she said, stop it. It'd be, it'd be so much fun. And I said, no, no, no. 
And she said, what do you think? And I thought, I think it's like going through the airport. When I go through the line, alarms are going to go off or something. No, this isn't an attic. She doesn't belong here. And so she said, stop, stop, let's go. And I said, I don't even know what I would wear. So she said, what do you want to wear? And I imagined, has anybody been to like a classical concert, the Philharmonic? I thought, I would imagine a gown, you know? And she said, wear it. And so I thought, really? And she said, yeah. And I thought, oh, how fun is this going to be? So I get this gown. And she tells me, I'm going to pick you up at this time. Cherie, this is not like a rock concert. You cannot just show up at any time. At a Philharmonic concert, you have to be there when the conductor does the downbeat, right? And I'm like, OK, so I'm totally ready. And I look in the mirror. I'm in this gown, and I'm telling you, I look so hot. It was so fun. And I thought, I'd never look so beautiful. I'd never, um, it, it was just a part of recovery that I thought, how cool is this, right? And then she's late. And I'm like, you said to be on time, and she's not there, and she's not there, and she's not there. Pretty soon, her car comes screeching up. She's getting a car, and we're like running stop signs trying to get to the symphony hall, you know, because you have to be there at the downbeat, right? So we get there, and she says, how about let's not go through the box office. Let's go through the backstage entrance, because we already have our tickets. And I said, are we going to be arrested? <laughs> I haven't been arrested in a long time. You know what I mean? And I don't want to be arrested going to the symphony. I mean, how stupid would that be? So I'm like thinking. And so she said, no, no, I think it would be OK. Well, don't think it would be OK. <laughs> it's either OK or it's not OK. No, no, I think it would be OK. So we sneak through the backstage entrance with our little tickets. And remember, how did I look? Hot. <laughs> so don't be afraid to say it because it was amazing so we sneak in and we're in this gown and we look beautiful and a couple musicians come up and say excuse me but you're not supposed to be back here and I looked at her like I told you you know what I knew that and I'm telling her I knew that and so I said I'm looking at her like we're in trouble. And, they, and he said what I thought, that when they go on stage, all of their personal belongings are backstage. So they don't want people just walking back here, right? So they're telling us that. And I'm like, I knew it. And she says, to, it was so cheap. She says, or so cheesy. She says, you know, this is my friend Cherie. She has never been to a concert before. And they all looked at me like I was a foster kid. You know what I mean? It was like, they all looked at me like, really, you've never been to a concert? And so one guy comes over, and he said, tonight's performance is amazing. They're going to do this piece. And the, the, the composer wrote it for this time period. This is who he was. And he sang the line that was going to be in every movement. And he sang it. And he said, listen to this. It starts with a French horn. And the French horn talks to the violin. And the violin talks to the woodwinds. And he's singing this. And I'm like, that is amazing. And I was mesmerized because it was so cool. And then at first I thought, is he kind of being a little flirty? <laughs> And, and everything in me said, oh, man, poor guy, because he looks normal. And I want to <laughs> have a T-shirt saying, you need to run. I <laughs> Has anybody met somebody so full of drama that you should have ran? So I'm thinking, you know what? I've never done a relationship right in my life, and you're looking at me with that look. You need to run. And I need a hat to warn someone, you know, something. Um, man, a mess in recovery, but still working, you know? And, and so he finally says, he looks at me and he says, um, would you like me to take you to your seats? And I thought, oh, hon, you need to run. <laughs> and so he takes us to the seats and, and he says, you know, um, enjoy the concert. And, and, and we start to go sit down. And he says, you know, afterwards, uh, a friend of mine, the trombone player, is, it's his birthday would you guys come to the party? And I'm thinking, no, you need to run. You know? and, and my girlfriend right away says, oh, yes, we would love to. <laughs> and I'm thinking, this poor guy. So, so anyhow, so the concert was amazing. Um, I, don't, I didn't realize that I love music of any kind. And that was, that it was just amazing. It was beautiful music and the concert hall. And how did I look? 
All right, that was, that was fun. And so it was like, it, we just, it was so amazing. And so afterwards, the, now the party is going to be at the Hyatt Regency, which is the, the musicians that are classical musicians are now going to sit in with the jazz band, right? So it's different music, different reason, and no, we're going to a birthday party. So I walk in, and it was just crazy to be there. It's like, what am I doing here? And, and I'm watching all these musicians, and they're all in tuxes and looking handsome. And, you know, it was, just, it was amazing. And I'm looking hot. And, you know, we're just having a great time. And, and then I hear this trumpet player with the band, and he's doing this incredible high C's trumpet licks with the band. And I look up, and I thought, oh, that's the guy that took us to our seat how different is this music, and he's so good. And I looked up, at the same time, he looked at me and he gave me the eye. You know what I'm saying? And I said, did he just give me the eye? I just want to say, oh, hon. So anyhow, I'm trying not to look at him, and I'm thinking, how do I tell him that, that um, um, you know, anything? So he comes down and he says, man, would you dance with me? And I said, no. <laughs> No. And he looked at me like that was the craziest thing. What do you mean no? And I said, no, no. I just, uh, you know, um, and he said, yeah, dance with me. And finally, it was weird to keep saying no. So I said, yes. And so we're waltzing around the room, him and his tux, me in my gown. And it was like stars were going off around us. It was so ridiculously romantic that I had to say, stop, I'm sitting down. So I sit down and he comes up and he said, who are you? And I said, oh, man, I'm a heroin addict in recovery. My dad is a crack addict. My sister has a porn sign on the Internet, and my other sister makes methamphetamine out of my mom's garage, and I'm just trying to get by. And he looks at me. <laughs> he can't even hardly breathe. And, and so he starts laughing. He just couldn't, he couldn't help it. He starts laughing so hard, and I said, who are you? And he said, well, I was an Eagle Scout. <laughs> and I thought, how funny is that? My dad is an ambassador for the United States, he says, to Bangladesh. Oh, good. My mom is a concert violinist. And I start laughing. I couldn't stop. And we were laughing so hard. I would tell one more story. My dad, my dad, I love my stepdad. Um, if you went over to my house, he would be going like, do you want some of this? <laughs> And, you know, I mean, and his dad's an ambassador. I'm thinking, how ridiculously crazy is this? So we just laughed and laughed and laughed. We decided we would never be an item, of course, right? How could we be an item when we're so different, right? But we liked each other, and he's a golfer. He says, you know, let me teach you how to play golf. I thought that'd be fun. So we learned how to play golf. I didn't realize that when he said, put the ball down, swing, I want the ball to go in the air towards that hole, that you're not supposed to actually do it that way. And the first time I swung and the ball went in the air to the hole, golfers fall in love with you when you do that. <laughs> and I didn't realize, he's like, I can't believe you played golf. And, and so we just were having a great time. And at one point he came over and he gave me a gift. Not my birthday, not anything hands me this gift, and I said, what's this about, you know? And he said, I just want you to have this. And I opened it up, and it was a brand new um, pair of golf shoes. For a golfer, that's like an engagement ring. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And I said to him, you need to meet my family, right? Because if you're going to fall in love with me, you need to know that this is my family. And has anybody ever thought they're going to bring someone home to meet your family and you want to call ahead of time and say, could you just be normal for 24 hours? <laughs> has anybody ever felt like that? I know you have. And so I'm thinking, I'm going to take them home to meet my family. And I want people just to behave just for a short period of time. <laughs> you don't even have to carry it on for days, just a short period of time. So I call my sisters. I'm going to bring someone home. I don't bring anybody home. I'm in recovery. They're all addicts. Um, and it's just awkward. And, um, and my sister, well, I'll tell you about her. So anyhow, so I call her and say, I'm going to bring someone home. And she's like, woohoo, you must be crazy about him because you don't bring people home. What's he do for a living? And I don't even want to say. 
She's like, come on, what's he do? And I'm thinking, I don't want to say. And, and I knew as soon as I said, she would make a joke, right? And so I said, he's a, a classical musician. And she laughed her head off. And, and I thought, you're a drug dealer. <laughs> so, you know, stop. So anyhow, so in, in, and I could see in, in when you're using, uh, like for me, in my addiction, um, I would have made jokes, too, about what he does for a living. And even when we first started dating, at one point he said, you know, I always wanted to be a singer. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, yeah. And I said, well, sing me something. You know, because I love singers. I'm, I'm not one, but I love them. I love music. And he sang an opera <laughs> for about 15 minutes. And I'm like, oh, stop. Don't ever do that in front of my family. Do you know what I mean? Because when you sing opera, I mean, it's loud, and it goes from one thing to the next. And, and so I knew that this poor guy is going to be eaten alive by my family. And so I said, you know, Brad, um, I told you about them. They're amazing. I love every one of my sisters and brothers, but they're unique. <laughs> you know, they're unique. So he says, no, 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 I get it. And we uh, went over for Christmas Eve. We're going to stay for Christmas. And um, I, um, when you become in your recovery and, and you take a faith-based journey, a, a lot of things change. So we're not sleeping together and we're saving it for marriage and all that kind of stuff. And some people in my, my family, they don't get that at all. You're saving what? <laughs> They're just, and so they're trying to get us in the same room, and we're trying to, like, be abstinence, and we're like, no, no, no. But anyhow, so we finally get that all straightened out, and in the morning, he gets up before I do, and he goes out to the kitchen, and my dad is doing a line of Coke on the table and smoking some pot, right? And so he's, he's really a nice guy. My dad is very funny, very nice guy, and he's like to Brad, do you want some of this? <laughs> And Brad is like, you know, I'm just looking for breakfast. And my dad thought it was a joke because holidays at our house, you just get off your face. Do you know what I mean? It's not about, we're not having a turkey in the middle of the table. We're having some Coke. You know, I'm, we're, you know we're, 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 we party hard, and there's a lot of drinking, a lot of drugs. So Brad says, I'm just looking for breakfast. And my dad laughs. And, and Brad is like, no, no, seriously. <laughs> And so then he, he says, do you want a drink? And Brad says, I, how about orange juice? And, and, and so now they're getting back on the same footing. And, and so Brad says, yes, on the orange juice. And my dad says, do you want anything in it? Because, you know, who wants just orange juice, you know? And so now they're, they're um, back on, and my dad thinks, who did you bring home? They are, like, not um, getting along at all. And I kind of come up to that situation, and I'm looking at Brad, and I'm looking at my dad, who I love, but he is 6'1", um, less than 100 pounds, he's strung out, um, his liver is the only thing big on him, and he's been using since he's 14 years old, and so they are just are from different places, and even their humor, their joking, all that kind of stuff, and I'm looking at these two guys going, man, and so then as we're kind of trying to kind of put band-aids and all of that, my sister shows up. My sister is amazing, but she's a stripper, and she is living with or hanging out with this guy that sells um, drugs for a living. He has a computer business, but that's just a front for his drug business. And he is just this huge guy, silent, looks like the mafia. They pull up. My sister comes in, and she walks like a stripper. I don't know if anybody knows any strippers, but she's just kind of like, hi, should we really <laughs> like you? <laughs> and Brad is like trying to look anywhere, and she's got this little tiny dress. We're in California. It's hot. She's got this little tiny dress on, and she is just um, having a good time, and she's adorable, and Brad's like trying to not look at anything. And finally, the more she drinks, she comes up to me, and please don't get offended, but this actually just happened. She comes up, and she says, um, Cherie, do you notice anything different? And I said, what? She said, I just had my boobs done. <laughs> Feel. <laughs> the whole time, Brad is looking around like, did she just say that? Because I, I, 
you know, and then the more drunk she gets, the more she wants to show you you can't see the scar. The surgeon was so amazing. And I'm looking at Brad like, I'm so sorry. And what did I say 24 hours just be normal? <laughs> so then my other sister gets there, who's a pee addict, methamphetamine addict, makes meth out of my mom's house. She is skin and bones. All her teeth are rotted out. Her hair is out in patches. Has anybody seen a meth addict that picks and... I mean, she can't, yeah, she can't keep, yeah, she can't keep her body still, she can't do any of that kind of stuff, and literally, when she came in, Brad looked at her, and he just wanted to cuddle her, does anybody see that she's like almost dead, and she comes in like this, hey, come here, give me a hug, she just, I think she really likes you, you know, and Brad is just like, Man, so her and her boyfriend come in. They've got crank sores or sores all over from picking. They are high, and they can't keep their body still. My brother comes in. He's alcoholic. My mom comes in. My mom's a pharmaceutical regulator. <laughs> <laughs> so if the group gets too sloppy drunk, she hands out diet pills. Come on, just take this on. You know, if they get too high, she hands out Valium. You know, she just regulates the group. And I told Brad this, but when you see it, he, he just looked at me like, she really does that. And I think, oh, you thought I was joking, right? <laughs> and so we spent the morning watching people get more and more wasted. And then finally someone says, because it's Christmas, let's open up presents, right? Right? So now we're sitting around the tree. We've got the stripper, we've got the mafia, we've got the pee addict, we've got my mom who's prescription drugs, we've got my dad who's, he's always happy because I mean, he's smoking weed all the time. I mean, he's just always in a great mood. And so everybody's around the tree and my younger sister says, I want you to open up my present first. And she's so excited. I, I you will love this. I, I'm telling you, um, I, I just, I can't even wait. So she hands me the present. I open it, and it's beautiful crystal, beautiful. Not math, but just crystal. And, um, and so I, I look at her, and I said, and I meant this seriously, like, where did you get this? Because it's beautiful. And she said, you think I stole it, don't you? <laughs> I wasn't going to go there. <laughs> And I thought, you know, and I was just going to tell her, no, no, I was seriously just like a normal conversation. Where'd you get it? And um, so she says, I got it from a storage unit. I said, was it your storage unit? <laughs> I don't have a storage unit. <laughs> thought, so now I'm sitting around. We've got drugs everywhere. We have stolen goods on our lap. And my, 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 my um, boyfriend's father is an ambassador for the United States. And this poor guy is just like, I don't even know how to speak anymore. But he was so gracious to everybody. But by the time we left, I thought he was just going to tell me, I'm sorry, but I cannot be with you. Because this is your children's grandparents. Do you know what I mean? If you fall in love with me and we step into a marriage or a relationship, this is Aunt Cindy with the tassels. Do you know what I mean? And so, <laughs> and so we, on our way home, he got just quiet and didn't say anything. And finally, hours into our drive home, he just said, are you sure you weren't adopted? <laughs> And I said, I'm sure. And I love my family, but they are a mess. My mom had me when she was 14 years old. I was her second child. She tried to abort six times. She did everything. She took pills, got in hot tubs, stuck coat hangers up inside of her trying to get the sack. I mean, literally had her first child thinking her and my dad would actually um, get together and be in love and happy ever after. They got pregnant in high school. She was 12 years old in the ninth grade. He was 15. He was already drinking, already probably alcoholic. Anybody relate to that? So through school, the, and then she gets pregnant. They decide to get together. When they got together, he quit school, tried to get a job, and he couldn't keep a job because of his drinking. And if somebody got on his case, like if you were his boss, he would say, what did you just say to me? Are you kidding me? You talking to me? And he would literally go to the boss. Well, he'd, oh, you broke your leg, sorry. He would literally go to the boss and get in his face, and then he would lose his job. Then he would come home to my mom and feel like it's your fault that I lost my job, and he would beat her. 
So their relationship started out so intense from the very beginning, and he could not, or did not get it together. So then she's holding my sister. My sister's a couple months old, and she finds out she's pregnant again. And she just said, I'm not doing this again. I cannot do this again and tried everything to self-abort. I mean, literally tried everything. Um, um, she, in the hospital when she had me, it was like even being able to say, she told me years later that signing the birth certificate felt like it committed her to have to take me home. And she said, I didn't want to sign it. I didn't want to name you and have to t do this again. Um, but she, of course, named me. I went home. My dad got more and more intense. My mom had five kids before she was in her early 20s. She had one after another after another. Um, my dad started molesting us when, we w when I was three months old. He was caught with me the first time. I don't know what it feels like to have normal parents. My mom went into depression and was angry. My dad was very um, abusive in every way and was alcoholic. And so literally um, growing up, I remember as a kid, there were times that I would look in the mirror and just try to be, maybe if I was better, maybe if I was funnier or cuter, that they would be more normal or loving. My mom said that, the, that she just shut down, especially when she had me. She said, I, I, I didn't hold you. Um, if you were in the bedroom crying, she was on the floor of the hallway crying. Do you know what I mean? She just couldn't, it's like she just could, couldn't do that. So I just didn't get that kind of stuff. When I was probably, um, I don't know how old I was, little, and I went to my grandmother's for Christmas. My grandmother's alcoholic. She's very funny, but very inappropriate. My um, uncle went, one of my uncles, has anybody seen anyone turn yellow because their liver shuts off? <laughs> One of my uncles was so yellow because his liver shut up, but he was so funny. And I remember asking him when I was a little girl, I said, Graham, Uncle Graham, why are you so yellow? And he said, my mama was a duck. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what? You know, even as a little kid, I can't, enter, I can't enter imagine that. So what do you mean your mom was a duck? But it was like, e you know, even uncles, um, um, grandparents, there was addictions almost all the way through our family. And some of you know what I'm talking about. It just, it's, it's like a thread. And so um, when I was really little, I had an aunt that came up to my grandmother's house. And I saw her once a year at my grandmother's house for Christmas. And she came up one time and she just said, um, you are so beautiful. And she, what she did, my hands are cold, so forgive me for this, but what she did is she just grabbed my face and she said, you are so beautiful, and she held my face, and I started crying. And I remember as a little girl, I, I, I wanted my mom to do that. Please, somebody. You know, I, I think I was starved for someone to do that. And when she did that, I just started crying. And what she did is she just kind of swept me up and held me until I was done. But she was very funny. And she was, um, well, everybody in California is a movie star, but she was an actress. <laughs> and, um, and, and she would tell me jokes. And I'm going to tell you one joke because she was so funny. Every time I saw her, she would tell me jokes. But I became like her kind of favorite child. I, I think that she knew I was an abused kid. She knew that, I, you know, we had these struggles at home, and she just loved me. But every time I saw her, every Christmas... She would look at me and she would say, what did you have for breakfast? And everything she said, I was supposed to say pea soup. So I'm going to ask you to say it. Every time I say something, you say pea soup. So what did you have for breakfast? What did you have for lunch? What did you have for dinner? What did you do all night? <laughs> so as a little girl, I would laugh because she was so, she was funny and it was cute and all that kind of stuff. And, and, um, and um, I think that she helped me survive. It was probably out of my whole life with all the craziness. Um, she really gave me, um, I, she looked at me and I felt loved. And she was bipolar. I don't know if anybody's bipolar, but she dealt with bipolar stuff. And, and she had some struggles. But when I was eight years old, I went to my grandmother's house thinking I was going to see her. And um, her car wasn't there. And I just said, Mom, you know, where's Annie Kay's car? And my mom said that your Auntie Kay is dead. And I don't want you crying because you will upset your grandmother. And I stood there. And the only thing I could think of is that if she was dead, she would have taken me with her because she loves me. And, and I, you know, my mom, of course, said, you know, you need to 
stop. And I didn't realize, and I don't know if it's the same in New Zealand as it is in the U.S., but there were a time when somebody killed themselves or died in, with suicide that nobody ever talked about it. So my mom literally, we'll talk afterwards for sure, but my mom literally um, was protecting my grandmother because my Aunt Kay killed herself during a depression. If you are bipolar, do not do anything during a depression. But literally, um, so I stayed outside, was waiting to kind of pull it together. Um, everybody went inside, and at that point, the only thing that I could do was just cry. I can't survive without her. Um, she was my auntie. She loved me. Everything else in my life was very chaotic, and um, I just cried and cried and cried. But there was a point when I was sitting outside. Has anybody seen, like, the clouds part and the sun kind of filters through the clouds? And all I heard in my head, not anybody's voice, but I heard in my head, what did you have for breakfast? And I thought, for some reason, it's going to be okay. And I went inside, did the whole Christmas thing, and I got home, and I thought, you know what? I'm just going to kill myself, you know? And um, I tried to figure out a way to do this. I, I looked, you know, I'm eight. I don't know what to do. And um, I thought, I'll just jump off the roof, you know. I'll climb up on the house and jump off. We had a one-story house. Um, so raise your hand if you know anybody that's tried to kill themselves. So literally, one-story house. Took me forever to climb up. I figured out I'm going to jump right on the driveway, asphalt driveway. That's for sure going to kill me. I climbed up, leaped off, um, and did I tell you I put a mattress down first? <laughs> <laughs> I landed right on this mattress, <laughs> and didn't, I'm laying there thinking, well, nothing, not even a scratch. And I think somebody came out and said, what are you doing? Go play. All right. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know it's like, I mean, it's just ridiculous, but my first attempt, it was eight years old. I think I've had tons in my life. Um, um, but anyhow, I eight years old. The first um, um, problem with after that jump is I hurt my hip. My mom ended up taking me to Children's Hospital eventually, and they found out that I had a disease called Perthes disease that was aggravated by the jump. They put me in braces and crutches and all that kind of stuff, started doing physical therapy. Um, the first time I walked into a place with nurses that came up and touched you and it was safe, it was life-saving what happened at that hospital. Um, I did physical therapy I, I, in a pool three times a week. I, you know, I thought I just went swimming, but they actually were doing movement, a range of motion and all that kind of stuff. And um, at one point, my mom said that it was too much um, work in the house to take care of me and the, the other kids and all that kind of stuff. And so they sent me to live in Canada with an auntie. Um, and even when they sent me away, I begged my mom, do not send me away. Because I thought, if you can't love me here, if I'm 3,000 miles away, you'll forget me. And I did everything to get them not to send me. Um, um, they eventually said it was for my own good. My dad had been kicked out of the house. Um, my mom moved a bartender in who was so, so funny, smoked weed all the time, just funny guy. Um, and... Um, and they, I think addicts, when they're lost in their addictions, a lot of times um, they're, they're self-absorbed and they don't take care of their kids well. So we, you know, and I, I'm not saying that to, can, to say anything against anybody, but in our family, the kids were really just not noticed much. And so I was sent to live with an aunt. I was horrible to this woman. She was a Christian. I didn't even know what that meant. I walked in and there was a dead guy on a cross on her wall. I said, who's that dead guy? <laughs> And she said, that's God. And I thought, oh, great. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I'm, I'm like, if that's God, don't even, you know, I'm not even asking anything else, you know. And, and, and so she did everything. She was, she was kind to me, but I would yell, like, I hate you. You cannot keep me here. And she would say, I love you. You can stay here the rest of your life. And I said, that's kidnapping. You need to send me home. And so I was not um, kind to her ever because I thought if she, if I was kind to her, if I showed her any affection, I would never see my parents again. And so I just was horrible. After a year, they sent me home. My dad decided he was going to do recovery, or my stepdad, my mom's boyfriend. Has anybody seen an addict in recovery? 
you walk in and say, hey, how are you? And then they bite your head off. Do you know what I mean? And so I came home, and he's trying to do recovery, and I'm not sure. I should have brought like a bottle of tequila. Drink this and then say hi. <laughs> you know, um, but um, um, it was not a good thing. And, and he at one point just yelled that, you know, the happiest times of our lives was when you were gone, and we do not want you back here. And I was 11 years old, and I stood there, and for the first time in my life, I thought, you know what? I don't know what I did wrong, but there's no way that I'm gonna, get the, um, I'm gonna get love here. There's no way. I don't, and it's like I can't figure it out. I can't. Um, and so um, someone had said, the reason people do drugs and alcohol is they don't want to deal with their emotional stuff, right? So I thought, then let me find some drugs. And I went out as an 11-year-old trying to find drugs. Um, I found them. And I just want to ask you, I'm not going to get into a lot of details, but do you think the person that gave me the drugs the first time at 11 was a safe person? They gave me as much as I wanted. And I'm telling you, the people that give an 11-year-old or 10-year-old or 12-year-old drugs um, usually have their own agenda. But the first time I did a drug, 27 minutes later, I didn't feel like killing myself. And I thought, are you kidding me? To me, it was the solution. You know what I mean? I finally found out what was going to work. Not only did I not feel like killing myself, but I didn't care whether you liked me. You don't like me? Too bad. Do you know what I mean? And I'm this little thing, but I'd be right in your face because drugs give you this kind of um, ability <laughs> to just be in someone's face. And so I thought, I just need to stay high um, the rest of my life. And I stayed high for the next 10 years. Started with quaaludes, started with um, a lot of um, pain meds, um, um, ended up pregnant the next year. Um, the, I, I, I ended up having um, eight and a half months pregnant. I ended up having twins. They were tiny because of what I was putting in my body. They did not survive. Um, and I think that I thought and I don't know why I thought that when I was pregnant. I thought, you know what, I'm going to be a great mom as I'm taking the next drug. I'm going to be a great mom, and finally I'll have someone to love as I'm taking the next drug. But I didn't put those two together. I didn't think one, like the drugs were hurting the babies. I didn't think, I didn't think anything. I don't think kids do. I don't think people do or addicts do. But I was strung out. Um, the boy lived for eight hours, eight and a half hours. The girl was stillborn. And the doctor came in and said, do you realize that what you put in your body caused this? And I remember thinking that was the meanest thing anyone's ever said to me. And I was so angry. But I did not put them together. Um, after I lost the twins, um, my mom said I should marry the person that um, I got pregnant by. He was in the Navy. Um, in his 20s, we ended up going into Mexico, got married. He moved me into his mom's house, and he went overseas for six months. Just putting out there, do you think his mom liked me? I was a 13-year-old drug addict that just ruined her son's life, is what she felt. And when she walked in the room, I could tell that she hated me. And again, I looked in the mirror, what is up? Because I didn't put them together. I couldn't figure out, here's another adult. Wh why, what is it? You know? But now I'm married, and I don't have to stay here. You know? I just felt like I don't have to be here. I don't have to stay here. And I ended up leaving, and I ended up on the streets of Los Angeles um, at 13 years old. Right now, today, there's about 80,000 kids like me on the streets. 80,000, not one or two. So when I ended up on the streets... Within 24 hours, I was picked up and funneled into a $32 billion industry. So I am saying what I saw at home was nothing compared to what I saw on the streets. The only difference is I didn't expect you to love me on the streets. So it didn't hurt as much, and I had a lot of drugs that got me through every day of the, that next 10 years. But I spent 10 years on the streets. We're going to talk about some of that um, within the next few days. But what I learned on the streets for myself is that we can get really twisted in our addictions. And when I talk about raise your hand if you have a sexual addiction, the reason I say that is that if you have one, I am going to beg you over the next few days, man, um, explore 
getting free of that because I've seen people go some dark places in their sexual addictions, in their anger, in their drug addictions, even, you know, for, for men and women uh, selling themselves or being in goofy relationships or going from one place to the next, we get really injured. And for that, that 10 years, I got injured. Um, I, um, um, at the end of 10 years, I was so burned out. Um, when I was 14 years old, I got kidnapped by a motorcycle gang. And I say kidnapped, um, but it was really, um, it's, it, I'll tell the story later, but it was, I ended up at, at, a, at a weekend where some bikers were initiating new members. I don't know what that means. Anybody know what that means? But they took three girls from the street for the initiation process. And I'm naive. I'm thinking we're going camping. <laughs> How fun is this going to be? And I get there, and um, 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 the girls got turned out, um, got beat, got raped. Um, one girl did not make it past that weekend. Um, I made it, but with uh, teeth missing and, and, and pretty beat up. Um, but the stuff that I saw on the street was very, very intense. So at the end of 10 years, I was really burned out, and I had seen some pretty, pretty intense things. And I had decided, I was in and out of working in clubs, in and out of working, doing a number of different things, but I decided at the end of my time that it's easier to sell drugs than most of the other things I was doing. So I was selling seven pounds of cocaine to a group out of San Francisco with the group that owned the drugs. I'm not, I was just somebody that ran them. I was nothing in this group. But I was selling um, the drugs to a group out of San Francisco from LA. We went, um, there's scales, there's chemicals, there's a lot involved in, in the process of um, selling drugs, not just kind of trust me, this is good stuff. And I remember thinking, is anybody normal? Raise your hand if you're normal, because I want one person on this planet to be normal. And I remember as we're selling these drugs to this guy that owned the restaurant, is I'm thinking, really? You own a restaurant. You know, what are you doing? We got the stewardess high on the way home from this drug deal. And I'm thinking, what? Well, bring the pilot in. You know what I mean? I'm just like, and, but anyhow, I'm looking for one person to be normal, anybody to be normal. And we do this drug deal. And now at the end of that, I have $67,000 cash in a suitcase, 11000 in another suitcase, and some drugs left. And we fly back to L.A. And I am still thinking, man, I'm so burned out and I'm so done. And I just... I want you to be normal. I met a doctor, head of cardiac surgery, buying a 14-year-old kid that I was hanging out with. You know what I mean? It's like, what? Are you, you're a doctor. And I remember thinking that I just, is there anybody normal? And we get home, and, and um, I'm burned out. I've been up for a week, freebasing coke and doing drugs. And, and I, I, we take the money, goes back to the guy that actually, it's his business. And I go in my room, and I crash. I mean, and when you've been up for a week, when you crash, you crash. I mean, it is not just that you go to sleep. So I went in and crashed, and this guy comes back, and he puts a gun to my face, slams it in my face, wakes me up, and he said, nobody steals from me. I'm going to blow your head off. And he's screaming and cussing, and I can't even wake up. I have been up for a week. You know, so I'm trying to wake up and find out what's this fool talking about. And, and I realize he's got a gun to my face. And I remember thinking for the first time in my life, thank you so much, because I am so done. Do you know what I mean? And I relax, and I'm thinking, I wanted to say thank you, because I don't know how to kill myself. I've tried, and I put mattresses down. Pull the trigger. Has anybody ever felt like that? I'm done. Just pull the trigger. And he said, are you crazy? I want to blow your head off. I said, are you my psychiatrist? Go ahead. You know? And now we're looking at each other. Go ahead. And he's just trying to get the money back. He, the $11,000 I had last is missing. He thinks I stole it from him. And I thought, are you trying to scare me? Because my next breath scares me. Pull the trigger. And he's like, you're nuts. I'm nuts. You got a gun to my head. You know what I mean? Who's nuts here? And I remember having this thing. And he finally turned around to walk away. And he says, if you don't have my money back by the end of the week... I'm going to blow your head off. And I'm thinking, really? Because <laughs> you could have blown it off right now. I'm thinking, I don't even buy it. 
You get out of here. You know what I mean? It's like, how crazy is that? You're not blowing anybody's head off. And I'm so mad that he's walking away. I can't even stand it. And I remember taking my next breath, not wanting to. It was like being on the mattress and somebody saying, go play. I don't want to play. I don't want to be here. I don't want to find the next drug. I don't want to find out what I'm going to do tomorrow. I don't want to do this. I'm done. You know, and I remember just being done. And I thought the next couple of days was so hard to get through. And I thought, I need some help. And does anybody want to guess where I went for help? I went to my mom's house. <laughs> the house is dark. Because drug addicts, they never open windows. You know, the house is dark. People don't get up till noon. It's, it, you know, you stick to the bathroom floor when you walk in my mom's house because it's just not the cleanest house ever. And I walk in and not much has changed, right? And, and I just thought, you know, I don't know what I thought. I, I was, she's going to look at me and say, I'm sorry, I, I love you, and where have you been? And, and I had teeth missing. I'm strung out on heroin. I, I'm skinny as, you know. And she says, how are you? <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm fine. Has anybody said that? You're totally crazy. And somebody says, you doing okay? Yeah, 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 I'm good. So anyhow, so we talked a minute, and my, my, my mom's boyfriend, Mac, is smoking some weed and watching a footy game. And, um, and he just says, um, you know, man, good to see you. And, you know, let's talk after the game, you know, that kind of thing. And my mom's talking, and, and I realized that this was crazy for me to come here you know they nobody's changing in and it's just crazy and and I'm starting to leave and my mom says you know I went back to school since the last time I saw you and I thought no way my mom had started having kids when she was a kid you know she was married to a, uh, a guy that beat her and molested her kids and then she's married to this bartender that smokes weed every day and you went back to school and I want to hug her I want to say what an incredible thing you know, um, what are you taking in school? And she looked at me so serious, and she said, social work. <laughs> and I thought, what? <laughs> Mom, <laughs> look around you. <laughs> and you know what? I thought, you could have said neurosurgeon, and I would have bought it. But social work. Mom, you don't even like kids. You know, what's up with that? And I want to say, you, my younger sister's in the garage making methamphetamine. My other sister's a stripper and has a porn site on the internet. I mean, you know, we're a mess. I'm homeless and strung out on heroin. Mac is smoking weed every day, watching television all day long. My brother's psychotically alcoholic. My grandparents died in their addictions. My real dad died in a crack house molesting three-year-olds. And you're going to be what again? I'm just curious. <laughs> did, you, did you say social work? And, 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 and please don't get offended by this, but you know the crimes where somebody gets stabbed like 300 times? I just for the moment understood that crime. <laughs> I said, I thought, I just want to stab you until I'm exhausted. And instead, all I said was good luck, you know? But in my mind, I thought, man, I have my whole life longed for you just to touch me, just to tell me you love me, my whole life. And um, I got home, and I thought, I'm just going to, and I live in a cr drug house. So I got home, and I'm just going to try to kill myself. And before I left the house, she gave me a manila envelope, and she said, I want to give you this. And I said, you know, thanks. And um, um, so when I got home, I'm trying to figure out, you know, how can I actually take myself out today? And I didn't have enough drugs to actually kill myself by ODing. We just sold all those drugs. I had some left, but not enough. And so, and I don't like pain, so some people can cut the wrist and stuff or a throat. I can't do any of that stuff. And I'm trying to figure out something to do. And I had walked in my room and threw the manila envelope my mom gave me on the bed. And I, it caught my eye. And I thought, what is she going to tell me? She, she doesn't love me? Do you think I don't know that? And I went to tear the envelope up. And I wanted to tear it up into a billion pieces. Because whatever she had to say to me, I didn't care anymore. Like, I, I'm not looking for a way out anymore, you know? I'm not looking for you to love me anymore. And I just went to tear it up, and it was the first time in my life, and if somebody gets offended, I'm sorry about this, but it was the first time in my life that I actually felt the presence of God. I grabbed the envelope, and I felt like, um, I felt safe for the first time in my life, no reason. 
I felt like God showed up for the first time in my life. I just felt God was there. And I felt like what he said, without saying anything, was take the papers out of the envelope. And I just wept. And I pulled them out. And my mom had written her life story in her social work program. And she got an A. So in red, she got an A. Did you write, Wendy, your life story? Did they ever have you do any of that through your program? Yeah, so you write, most programs will have you write that. So she got an A, and her instructor said, underneath the A in red, please give this to Cherie. And I thought, what's that about, you know? And I, and I started to get through this. I could read second or third grade level. I'd been on the streets for 10 years. Reading was not, um, you know, I, I, just, I was just rusty, I guess. But So I was fairly illiterate, and I'm going through this paper, and my mom was abandoned by her alcoholic mom most of her life. She was molested by her dad, molested by some uncles. There was drugs and alcohol in, uh, involved in her family. And so it was just telling her story. Then she meets my dad in high school, ends up pregnant. He ends up beating her, so it talks about that. It talks about her meeting my, her boyfriend, which was my, I consider my dad or my stepdad. Talks about his, um, his issues, his addiction. Talks about all the kids. But on the second page, I took the second page of the third page, and on top of the third page it said, the only way I survived is I took my anger and hatred out on my second child and I ruined her life. And I couldn't breathe. For the first time in my life, somebody said, you know what, it's not about you. It wasn't about you. Her survival was that she couldn't accept this middle child or the second child. And I just wept. And I remember feeling like God said, I, I could change that. I can, I, can, I can bring you into recovery. I can help you, all that kind of stuff. You are deeply loved by me. And I cried. I had teeth missing. Remember I said I got beat up. I had teeth missing. I'm strung out. I'm barely illiterate. And I just cried. I had 42 warrants for my arrest at that moment. And I said, you know, nobody cares for me. And I felt like what God did. For, uh, raise your hand if you have a Christian background or a faith background. What I felt like what God did for me at that moment, and please try to just see this in, at any level, but I felt like what he said is let me give you a, a vision or a sense of who you are the day after resurrection. Does anybody get that? The day after all of this is done, do you think I'm an addict? Do you think I'm damaged? You know, and he just, I didn't even see the whole thing, but I saw enough that said, if that's who I am, the day after resurrection, I'll give you my whole life because I, I don't want to be here. I don't, know how, I don't know how to breathe anymore. And I remember just at that moment saying, whatever you ask me to do, I'm going to do. And um, what he asked me to do was just stand up and let him love me. He didn't say, stand up and stop shooting heroin. Never said that to me. Stand up and stop lying. Don't sleep with that guy. I mean, he didn't say any of that kind of stuff. What he said is, let me love you. And in that, you'll start feeling your healing. Um, um, I called, and I'm going to close with this. I called in a friend of mine um, who was the only person I knew that didn't do drugs. He was really messed up, but he didn't do drugs. And I said, um, I want to go somewhere and do recovery. And he said, you know, he called his sister. His sister said I could come over to her place. She lived eight and a half hours away. I got in my car. I didn't take any drugs. <laughs> I, I went to her house, right? Um, can you come up for a minute? Yeah, yeah. So I show up at her house, and she, no, 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 go behind you, right, right behind you. So I show up at her house, and she looks at me. <laughs> And she was beautiful like you. <laughs> and I'm, by the time I show up, I'm withdrawing a bit, right? So I'm not in the best mood. And I'm, I'm like, um, okay. And she opens the door and she says, um, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> and I thought, whatever. <laughs> and she said, I just want you to know that I love you. Mm. Could you imagine saying that to someone? Mm. She said, I just want you to know I love you. And I, I was so angry because I thought, you don't even know me. And my mother doesn't even love me. And I remember looking at her thinking, I, I, just, I, I just felt this anger. And she brought me into her house, and she put some Christian music on. 
a couple hymns. And has anybody felt like it just makes your skin crawl? It's like, can you shut that off? Because that it was just like it was too much. Like I'm used to listening to some pretty hardcore music, and that was just too much. And I said, you know, that's not soothing to me. And she said, oh, you'll get used to it. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I hope not. Yeah. So I thought, I hope not. And she goes into the kitchen, and she starts um, making some food. And I walked in, and I said, excuse me, do you have any coffee? She said, no. Tea? Um, Dr. Pepper? Do you have any chocolate? And she said, nope. And she says to me, real sweet, I'm a vegan vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what is that? And she said, I don't eat anything that has a mother. And I thought, I don't want to eat your mother. <laughs> I just want some coffee. <laughs> Thank you. So anyhow, so what was really funny about this woman is she was, she was so opposite of who I was. And I remember after asking her, coffee, tea, Dr. Pepper, you know, I'm an alcoholic too, and I'm withdrawing from everything. I need some sugar. Can you just give me a cup of sugar? You know, anything. And she doesn't have anything in her entire house, just normal stuff. So she says, would you like some water? <laughs> Has anybody been an alcoholic? Water tastes nasty. You know what I mean? It's like we, th we think, you know, I can't stomach water, actually. And, and people look at you like, really? You can down tequila, but water isn't tough, you know? And I remember saying to her that I just can't stomach the taste of water. And she said, oh, you'll get used to it. <laughs> but she gave me water, fruit, um, healthy stuff. She would tell me, you know what? Um, we're going to go outside and take a hike. And I would look at her and say, you could take a hike. <laughs> Because I'm withdrawing. She's like a 1,000 years old, and I was 23 years old, and I can't keep up with her. She's like outside in the sun, hiking around. She's a health nut. She's just crazy. And, and, and all week long, I'm just trying to avoid her. I'm trying to shock her. I told her every story. When I was kidnapped by the biker group, I watched them rape and kill a 13-year-old where she could not scream anymore because blood was filling up her lungs. And all you could hear was that sound of gurgling. And I told her every detail because I wanted her to judge me one time. Don't tell people you love them when you don't know them. And I was just telling her everything. And every 20 minutes, she would go to the bathroom. I'd go out and smoke. We would just come back and tell more stories. And at the end of about a week, she said, what's the worst thing that you ever did? And I thought, when I was 10 years old, I was in a room with my cousins. We were all having a great time, just joking around. And an uncle came in, um, thought we were asleep. We all pretended to be asleep because we were supposed to be asleep as kids. He molested me and left. No one was asleep in the room. And I thought, you know what, was a, it was a time when I realized that I can't pretend I'm anything. I am a mess and I'm damaged. And, and she started crying and she said, you didn't do anything. And it was the first time someone said, you know what, this was not your fault. I didn't, I didn't invite him in. I didn't ask to be molested. Um, I love my family, but I didn't ask to, for any of that stuff. And it was the first time someone just said that to me out loud. It wasn't your fault. And I wept, and she wept. And when she wept, I said, you know, why are you crying? And she said, man, I'm crying for you. I'm so sorry for what you went through. And I just held her, and she held me. And as soon as, Christians are funny, because as soon as we got to that moment, she went like this, and the Bible slid out from her sleeve. <laughs> I thought, where did that come from? And we were, we were doing Bible study. And I said, as soon as she realized that I loved her, she told me about David, which is a king that killed off this um, guy because so, he got his wife pregnant and told me about this other girl that got caught um, sleeping around, and they were going to stone her to death. Do you know, in those days, if you got caught sleeping with somebody, they, they literally bashed your head in with boulders. Raise your hand if you would have been in trouble. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I'm like, are you kidding me? And so I'm listening to that story thinking, now that, is that harsh? And they said, that was the penalty, you know? But, you know, she said that, that, that Jesus or God or was kind of in the group, and 
And this woman is looking at the ground, waiting to be killed, waiting for her skull to be bashed in by these stones that all these people were, had in their hand ready to throw at her. And he said that all Jesus said, who was, she told me, the Son of God or God in the flesh, but all he said is he just looked up in the room and said, if you are without sin, if you haven't done anything, thought anything or whatever, you throw the first stone. But if you have, if you've done anything, just walk away. Leave her alone. And when she said that, I thought, wait, God himself is not judging us? Not even judging the people with the stones? Um, and she said, no, he's literally trying to help you, trying to take you into recovery. And it changed me. And I'm going to end with a story that she told me that changed me more than anything. She told me there was a crazy guy. Raise your hand when you know who this guy is. Crazy guy. Kind of guy that you would just be, you'd be careful in his presence because you could get beat. Do you know what I mean? He was just that guy. Nuts. He got literally kicked out of town, chained up naked, living in a cemetery, cutting on himself with stones, higher than a kite most of the time, and this guy was nuts. And the whole time, I'm thinking, well, who was that guy? And she said, he was nuts, filled with a thousand demons. And I'm thinking, I think I dated that guy, <laughs> you know? And has anybody dated that guy? You know what I mean? It's like, she's telling the story, and I'm thinking, you know what, what happened to him? Because you know what I want to have happened to him? I want him to have body parts cut off. If Jesus is God, he gets out of a boat, that guy runs towards him, right? But if Jesus is God, and he spoke the universe into existence, and he created all things, maybe he could just speak, and this guy falls apart cell by cell. Wouldn't that be fun? And so I'm thinking, what if you just get skinned alive, or lightning bolts come down? And, and I'm thinking, so I'm thinking, what happened to that guy? And she said, did I tell you he was crazy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, I've been in a car with somebody driving. We're all high. We have drugs in the back, right? The police come behind us, pull us over. We're all probably going to prison for what we have in the car. And the driver says, what would you pull me over for? And I'm like, really? You can't even shut up right now? Because <laughs> right now is a good time not to be an idiot. And so you know what? I know that guy. You know, that he said, as soon as Christ comes up to him, he says, whatever, curses him out, cusses him out. And I'm like, really? The only hope you have is standing right in front of you, and you're cussing him out? I think, what happened next? Because what I want to have happen next, I want him to be taken out. What if he was every molester? What if it was every person that I ever was in relationship? What if he was one of the bikers? What if, what if, what if? And so I'm like, what happened next? So she says what happened next is Jesus pulls out every demon, walks him down to the water, cleans him up, and he's in his right mind for the first time ever. Right? And I thought, wait a minute. That is not how I wanted it to end. And I was angry. I was like, that's not how I wanted to end. That's not, that doesn't make any sense to me. Because I didn't hear you say that he said, I'm sorry. I didn't hear you say that he begged for forgiveness. I didn't hear any of that. What do you mean he was just walked and cleaned up? Because I didn't hear anything. And I'm so, I was just so angry. And she said the thing that changed my life forever. She said one thing that most people don't realize about that story is this guy was so full of addiction, so full of pain, so full of his own damage that he couldn't even say out loud, help me. But the depth of his heart said, please don't leave me like this. And God himself said, I won't. And he never spoke a word. He never asked for forgiveness. And when he was cleaned up, and I thought, you know what? So we have... I believe if we look up long enough, we have a God that says, you know what, I know even in your heart what you're asking, even when you can't say it out loud, even though your addictions keep your mouth shut, keep yourself silent, I will not leave you like this. I will not walk away from you. And I think it changed me. And from that point on, literally, I just stepped into recovery. What if I, we have a God that says, I delight in your recovery? I can get you out of all of this stuff. I can change your very desires. And, um, and I actually believed it. And we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about what I learned as far as about addictions, but literally what I learned 
about who God is and who our, what our recovery looks like and the fact that we can go from being in such bondage to our addictions to being free maybe for the first time ever and then offering freedom to our kids and their kids and their kids. Um, before we qu quit, I'm going to turn it over to the pastor. Does anybody have a question, a comment? You were asking some things, and I'm sorry I didn't stop in between. Anybody have anything that they want to say before we end for tonight? Yes, sir. About tonight. I was surprised for I could understand the philosophy behind the way God allowed us to go to the part of Buddhism in which there's God, the third heaven. Uh, sometimes I wonder if the Trinity bypassed all that crap and go to the good stuff and still be yeah. able to serve God. Yeah. And so that's, is it that's why I went with the devotional stuff. You end up so wandering off. Yeah. So it says he, one of the things that he said, and I've heard a lot of people say, is I try to understand the philosophy of a God that will allow us to go through what we go through. And so I asked God one time, D why did you allow my father to molest me at three months old? Because I don't get it. I don't get it. And I felt like what God said, not through any voices, but through the Holy Spirit, is I didn't allow anything. I stood in front of your father every single time and tried to talk him into recovery. And raise your hand if you know that God has stood in front of you at times and said, please don't go there. Don't do that. Don't say that. Every time I shot heroin, I believe we had a God that said, you know, baby, this is not going to fix it. Do you know what I mean? And so I think God is the only innocent party sometimes. I believe that he tries to change us. He tries to get us not to hurt each other, tries to pull us out of addictions, but we have choice. I can go out and do whatever I want when I leave this building. I choose to be in recovery. Any of us can go out and do whatever we want. We can molest our kids. We can beat our spouses. We can, we can uh, talk smack about each other. We can do all that kind of stuff. I can, I can drink. I can get online and do Internet stuff. I can get lost in sexual addictions. I can do all this hidden stuff, or I can choose to be healthy. Um, but when I make that choice, it is on me. I think I'm motivated by an enemy that's bigger than me, but I don't think God says, you know what, I'm going to slam her with all this stuff because, man, when she gets through it, she's going to be really a good spokesperson. I don't think he works like that. Um, one of the things that the Bible says that I love is God plans evil for no one, for no one. Um, if evil has come in your life, for one, check your own stuff, get some help, and know that sometimes generationally, like with my mom, generationally, she was never given love. She didn't know how to love. So she was literally um, um, saddled with that. And then she had her own kids. And those kids then had kids. And somebody has to say, enough, enough. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stand up. Um, and it's not going to be easy. Recovery is never easy. But I don't think, um, I think that we have to look at our own choices every day. Anybody else? Questions before we close? Tomorrow we're going to talk about, I think the thing that set me free in my life was, is the most important thing. Um, addictive personality is going to cover that. We're going to cover a lot of different things. If you want um, just time where we hang out, um, we'll hang out. Um, can we do an anointing, Pastor? Um, um, I got anointed for healing at one point. And anointed is just where somebody literally um, through, the, through oil with a representation of the Holy Spirit or with God just puts um, oil on your head and does a special prayer for healing. And so we're going to, if you want to be anointed for emotional recovery or uh, recovery and addictions, um, please just let us know. Um, you know, I'd be honored. I'm going to work with a pastor on that. I'd be honored to do that. But sometimes um, during this week, if you're dealing with anything, just say out loud. And if you don't want to say your own stuff, just tell me I have a friend, <laughs> and we'll cover it that way. So, Pastor, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, and, um, and I hope to see you all this week. If you have a friend that is doing any kind of recovery work, grab them. Just drag them here. All right. Do you want it? Yeah.
special thank you to Cherie for being very vulnerable. I'm sure that uh, some of those things that she shared with you, um, you would have seen, you would have heard in her voice that it was hard. It was really difficult. And so, Cherie, thank you for being available to the Lord to be able to share that with us. Uh, what we're going to do is close off uh, with a word of prayer, and then um, if you would like special prayer or to, to speak with someone, uh, there's a few of us that will remain behind up front here. The rest of you, we'll ask you to move out. There's some refreshments just down the corridor, like I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, please help yourself there. There'll be something to drink, something to snack on, and uh, good people to talk with. So um, those of you that want to remain behind can. And then again, tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock, we'll be back here together. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we have heard some gut-wrenching things tonight. We have, um, some of us in this room, have experienced some gut-wrenching things too. The kind of healing that we see you bring is what we know we need. What we know we as individuals need. As husbands, as wives, as parents or as children. Lord, I pray for your spirit to take hold of every single one of us and uh, to do your work in us. We are um, slow to learn sometimes. We think we can do it our way, but it just doesn't work. Father God, I would pray that you would forgive us for standing in your way of accomplishing something beautiful that you still want to do with our lives. So tonight, I pray for every single person here that you would touch their lives, that you would give them your grace, your salvation, and a fresh start in you. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. When we talk about prayer, I just got to say, remember I said that Donna, the woman I went over to her house, every 20 minutes she went to the bathroom and I went outside and smoked. Um, when I fell in love with her, one of the things I said to her is, I love you and I know you're a health nut, but I think your kidneys are failing because <laughs> nobody goes to the bathroom that much. And she said to me that she's from a family that is very judgmental. I don't know if anybody's, raise your hand if you've met a judgmental Christian. So she's from a family that's very judgmental, and now I'm in her house, and she said, I, I'm just surprised that you're in my house, and every time I felt like judging you, I went to the bathroom and just prayed, God, let me not judge her, let me not injure this child. So at the same time that I'm doing my healing, she was doing her own healing about that whole spiritual thing. But one thing I learned during that time is the power of prayer. Um, it kept her being able to minister to me without judging, and it changed my life and her life. So when, when you offer someone to hang out and pray, man, there's some power in someone um, praying for you. So just know that I believe sometimes the only thing that changes us is when we stop long enough to say, can I pray with you? And we ask God himself to come in and intervene. So, so um, I just wanted to say, for one, um, if you are wanting prayer, hang out. If you're not, let could we pray before you guys take off, and then whoever stays around, would you would you pray for the whole group? Stand up if you just want prayer, but you you just want it personal. You don't want to say kind of what it is. Anybody? Okay, awesome. And you don't have to stand up because you're like so. Anybody wants prayer? Yeah. Stand up. And don't be, don't be afraid to stand up because you know what? There are some times that, that I have to look around and say, you know what? I don't care what anybody else is doing. I'm done carrying this. And so um, uh, literally pray for Bill. Father God, again, you know everybody who's just responded. Maybe even, maybe even one or two that just feel too awkward to stand up. But we would pray, Lord, that um, you know their stories and that you would write a new story all over their lives. It'll be seen in the way they live, in, in the thoughts they experience, the feelings, the, the healing that comes. And uh, so, Lord, again, just more of your spirit is what we pray for, because we just want to acknowledge you tonight as the one who brings true healing. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Save me a grape. Whoever's going down there, I saw some grapes. Save me some.